We should all prepare for a 15% fall in house prices. Let's have a look. Hello everyone, Florian Heiser here and welcome to another episode of Heiser Says. Grab your stein of coffee because I saw this article from the ABC and, well, I thought we should go through it again. It it feels like a flashback, guys. Borrowers should brace for a 15% fall in home prices as interest rates rise warned the RBA. Now, remember when the RBA was doing modeling and looking at the impact of a 40% fall? Or when the argument was made that simply a 1% increase in the cash rate would drop property by 33%? What's the implication of an actual 15% fall in property? Because I'm seeing stuff on Twitter, I'm seeing people predict a 70% fall in property, all of these big numbers. And well, I'm, I'm becoming quite cynical about a lot of the stuff that I see and read because it attracts eyeballs, it attracts attention, it attracts viewers. I've seen it on my own content. You do something positive, no one cares. But something scary or something concerning, the eyeballs jump to it. Now, right now, the capital city asking property price, hang on, I'm going to full screen it so I can see it. We're seeing here 1.2 million with change, and this is from SQM. This is the week ending, 5th of April, asking prices. We look at the national average, and I'll just, there we go, 792 for all houses, 720 with change for three bettors. Three bettors is kind of, it's a normal house. It's it's one where you can raise a decent sized family. I know, I have four kids in one room right at the moment. Now, if we look at Cities in particular, Sydney is just going gangbusters, 1.7 for all houses, 1.5 for three bettors. And you can see that increase there quite clearly. If we look at Melbourne, same type of thing. You've got all home, all houses, 1.1 1. 1. 1, and three bettors, 1 and 70 grand with, with change. Okay, but you can see that growth, particularly since, well, just since 2020 or even since 2016 or 15, it's really gone up in in Melbourne. Now, Brisbane, my city, you can just see how crazy we've had it. We were slowly growing, you know, at reasonable rates, and it's just shut up now. All houses, 900 grand, three bettors, 805. I literally just got a uh, another land valuation notice from the government, so my rates are going to go up again. And yeah, it's just, just climbing up. But okay, so those are the numbers right now. They're the asking prices, and we're starting to see a bit of a shave here. So I thought we'd have a look. We'll bring out the Excel. Let's play with a few numbers. So we've got the capital city average here at 1.2 million. And down here I have, should I draw on this? No, I won't. You can see what I mean. Down here I have the mortgage repayments based on a 30-year mortgage. Okay, and I've I've chucked in 7% interest as, you know, a worst case scenario. But we can, let's put it in at, at five, what we're getting for fixed rates now. So if you got it for 30 years, you're paying 5, 5% fixed. You got a 20% deposit, your loans for 975000 You're paying about five five two a month in repayment. So that's a decent chunk of money. Now, if we have a look here, I've got the capital city average, Sydney, Melbourne, and Brisbane. Or I've done the three betters because they're the most important. Now, you have to remember the average mortgage is five hundred and 80,000, or the, sorry, the average loan is 580,000. So I'll put that at zero. There you go. So your average payments at 5% are three grand. Okay, but I thought we'd play with this up here to have a look at what these falls actually mean when we see 15, 15%. So a 15% fall for capital city average would take it down to a million bucks. Sydney would go down from 1.5 to 1.3 million. Melbourne would go from 1 million to 916, where Brizzy would go from 805 down to 685. So let's just play with those numbers. Let's say you've got a 20% deposit, 5% interest rates. We're looking at, because 5%, sure, it could be fixed. What if the variable gets up to 5%? We'll just put that out there. It may not. But then we're seeing to service that alone of, for a 15% fall in Sydney, Okay, you got a 20% deposit. You're still looking at a loan of a million bucks. At 5%, you're still spending five grand at the beginning of a loan to repay it. Let's say we change that to 3.5% for variable. You're still talking just a tad under 
a tad under 4,700. Now, if we go down to 2%, let's up that number a bit higher. I don't know, we'll make it make it 5.5 because you're a risk factor. You can see there, these are the ones that are going insane, but you're never going to have anyone uh, with a 2% deposit on a $1.3 million loan that's going to be more like 700 grand or 600 grand. So you can see the, the impact that that's going to have. Now, if Sydney drops 20%, you're still looking at $1.2 million. If it drops 30%, you're looking at $1 million bucks for a three-bedroom house in Sydney. That's still a lot of money. That's still insane, particularly when we compare it to wages and what a family earns. Melbourne, 15% for you at 916 grand, 20% for you at 862 and a 30% for you, for you at 754. Now you've got to understand, people are used to these numbers. These are the anchor numbers. So all of this is going to look like a bargain to people. And they'll be diving in. People will be diving in to buy property. Brisbane, if we had a 15% fall, we'd be down to 684000 If we had a 20% fall, we'd be down to six forty four. And if we had a 30% fall, we'd be down to 563000 So let's let's put that in there. 563, 780. You've got a, let's say, 5% deposit. Oh, no, we'll put a 20% deposit. We'll be sensible there. So you're looking at 451,000 interest rates, we'll say 5.5. You're talking a two and a half grand repayment. That's in line with what we have now. So let's say 199, and you've got a mortgage of 580. So we're still a lot cheaper. Money is cheaper right now. But, you know, it's not going to be as scary as people think, guys. It's not going to be as scary. So I'm looking at the wrong screen to, to enter this. Okay, so if we get these big drastic falls, you're still going to be able to, you know, there'll be people jumping in to get these loans. There'll be people be jumping in to get these properties. Now, what about, I saw, I think, macro business were putting up 72% fall in property. Let's, let's, I mean, I'll just change this one to 72, then it'll all be automatic. Let's have a look. We'll see what that is. Because, frankly, this is an insane number. So, boom. There we go. Okay. So, the capital city average would go down to $341,000, everyone. Okay, and if you had a 20% deposit, you're paying 5%. You're looking at 1400 bucks. How many people do you think would dive in to Sydney property for 438000 And sure, don't get me wrong, it's happened. It's happened in Ireland as well. Where property in there, well, in Ireland, it was 52% in some of the cities it dropped. So we'll, we'll look at that in a sec. But then you got 300 grand in Melbourne, 225 in Brisbane. I mean, here, if, if this happened, I would seriously have to look at just buying another house. Just, you know, finding money and getting another house because it's not going to last forever, isn't it? Oh, wait a minute, wait. Oh, no, I'm talking about property. So you can discuss these things. Shares you can't now with ASIC's rules. Anyway, if we look here at Ireland, you can see if we had the equivalent of Ireland, 52 in the capital. I will just, yeah, anyway, you're talking average 585, Sydney 752, Melbourne 517, and Brisbane 386. Those are huge falls. But there's, there's a little difference between Australia and Ireland. I don't think we can make the comparison. I want to dig into it a bit deeper and present it as a video, but we have, well, we still have higher yields for our property than they had when they're about to tip over, and we've got negative gearing, guys. So, you know, people don't want to make money. So... I just thought I'd look at some of these figures to put it into perspective so we can appreciate the actual impact of this and see these numbers. And if it is a reality, if it's actually going to happen, because remember, they're predicting a 15% fall. That's not going to take us that far back, everyone. It's still going to be pretty expensive. I mean, what do we have here? So capital city average, 15% is going down to 1 million. Let's bring up this chart. Just upload it here. So what are we looking at? We're going down to 1 million bucks for all houses. Uh, 1 million 36 I've got there. 
So we're sitting sitting there. April 2021. Do you all remember April 2021 when housing was so cheap? And and uh, I should bring up some of the videos we were discussing on the channel then. So a 15% fall would still... Well, it won't take it. We need to look at it in time, guys. If we look at... Let's have a look at, Sid, at Sydney. So if we're going back in time in Sydney for three betters, we're going up for 15% is 1.3 mil. So we'll go back. Come on. I'm looking at one screen here and, and the mouse is on this screen here. So it's, it's all a bit funny. So there you go. We're going back in time to April again. Now let's have a look at Melbourne. Maybe Melbourne will be better. We're, we're going, what are we going to? Uh, Melbourne, three better, 916. Okay, we're going 916. So 1 million. Let's go back in time. Oh, oops. Oops, come on, come on. Yeah, come on. Come on, get me 916. Up. Oh. So we're going, say, to 2019, November 2019, guys. Oh, boy. Now, Brisbane, this is going to, this will be a dramatic one. So we go 685, 15% fall. And hang on. Hang on, wrong screen, guys. So, boom, six, what are we? 685. Come on. There you go. So October 2021. So still we're not going that far back. It just shows you the insane growth that we've had. If we went back to 2021, you'd be looking at 575, which is closer to a 30% fall for Brisbane. Everyone we went back to that time frame. So that's the thing. When people are talking about these big falls in property, it's just grown such an insane amount. Even if we went back to, you know, if we if we went back to eight hundred and we went thirty percent from that, that that's still going to be a bit painful. So let's let's look at what the RBA are warning us here. So borrowers should brace for a fifteen percent fall in home prices as interest rates rise. Warns the RBA. The Reserve Bank is warning of serious risk for those who are heavily indebted with limited saving buffers, while painting a generally upbeat picture of the resilience of Australian households as interest rates rise. Now, here's the thing. There are always going to be people that are in this situation. And I don't know if it's going to be as many as people hope to have a snowball effect. You've got to understand the negativity with property in Australia is going to, is going to get more attention than anything else. Okay, It gets the clicks. It gets the views. People can make money just spruiking this negativity, guys. I saw it. I saw it. You know, when, when we were every article that was coming out was property would fall forty percent, property would fall this. So you've got to, you've got to be skeptical about anything we see here. Uh, don't get me wrong. I'm not happy with the situation we're in here in Australia. That property is just going nuts, and I agree. It's it's a bullshit Ponzi scheme. But I think there's a higher chance of the government stepping in to prop it up than to allow the market to self-correct. Don't you? How many people would happily vote for Palmer's 3% mortgage cap when they're getting desperate? The bank's twice-yearly financial stability review reported that, on the whole, Australian mortgage borrowers are in a much better position to deal with rising interest rates than they were before the pandemic. I'm thinking a lot of people have built up buffers. And I think it's two things. One, government money coming everywhere. Two, change in lifestyle. I, th- I think people don't need to appreciate how, m- or how much of an impact this has all had. So many people have realized, oh, you know what? I don't need to go out every bloody weekend. I don't need to, to go to the pub and piss money away with the mates. I, you know, oh, so I can stay at home. I can save money. Wow. Most indebted households have benefited from strong growth in housing prices over the past year. And coupled with high mortgage repayments in excess of scheduled repayments, the vast majority have accumulated substantial additional equity in their homes, the report noted. The RBA, esti- the RBA estimated that only around 5% of loans now have an outstanding loan-to-value ratio greater than 75%, compared to almost a quarter at the beginning of 2020. So there you go. So five percent. Now, now let's let's um, hang on. 
Let's look at this. Okay, we're going here from... Okay, 2020. 2020 all homes. 2020. So we've gone up, say, 983 grand to 1.2. So what growth are we looking at here? What growth are we looking at here? 985. We'll just round it to 1.2. Just doing this in Excel, guys. What growth is this? Because... Okay, we're seeing this here. So we're looking at about a 20, 22% growth in that period. So if we had 5% of those, oh no, sorry, a quarter of those houses in trouble, but property has grown to 22%, okay, so it's, it is actually, it's not just property going up that's, that's solving this. So... This means that 95% of borrowers, it would, it would take more than a 25% drop in home prices to send them into negative equity. The dangerous position where borrowers owe more to a bank than their home is worth. So let's, what are we talking about here? 25% drop. So if we go back over here, we'll put 25% in here. Okay, that would mean Sydney would, or capital city average would be 900 grand. Hang on. Capital city average would be 914,000. You've got three bedrooms in Sydney, will be 1.1, nearly 1.2. Melbourne, you'd be 800,000. And Brisbane, 604,000. Now, if people are in negative equity, are they instantly going to sell? Is the bank going to force them to sell? No, no, it won't. If you keep paying them repayments, does it matter? Do they care? No, they're not going to. Because there's a cost involved in liquidating. It's a pain in the ass. If you keep going, you keep going. And then if you just write, if, if it's your home, do you even care what the equity is? Now, if you're leveraging that equity to buy another property and another property and another property, like all the real estate gurus are, then you might be in trouble. So then you might need to liquidate some of your properties to get back into a positive position. But is that, you know, how much of an impact is that actually going to have? And how many of those people are already preparing for that situation? We've had viewers on the channel explain how they're preparing and selling some of their properties was to prepare for this, to cash out. So you don't, here's the thing, you don't build up a, a portfolio. Sure, you may get lucky building up a portfolio of property, but bloody oath, I, I imagine you're going to do everything you can to hold on to it. Hey, you can always put rent up. So... The share of loans in negative equity is also estimated to be exceptionally lower at less than 0.25%, down from 2.25% um, in January 2020, the review added. So the, oh, there you go. There you go, guys. I, I can't be surprised with just the insane growth in property. We've seen it in Brisbane. So how's price fall forecast? The improvement in both of these metrics has mainly has been mainly driven by the exceptional surge in housing values during the pandemic, with property prices surging by almost a quarter over the past year, in the steepest growth since since the late 1980. However, the RBA has warned that much of the gain is likely to be unwound in the next couple of years as interest rates rise. Estimates using a model of the housing market that takes into account historic relationships between interest rates and both uh, demand and supply factors suggest that a 200 basis points increase in interest rates from current levels would lower real housing prices by around 15% over a two-year period, FSR, the FSR noted. Okay, so two years, we're talking about it, to that 15%, guys. So per annum, so we got 7.5. So there you go. You, oh, I should round that anyway. Yeah, there you go. That's in the first year, an 8% fall. And then another 8% fall, or 7.5%. It's important that lenders and borrowers consider the potential for falls in housing prices, particularly for loans at high LVRs. Now, the biggest thing I think we need to consider here is the government, the government coming to the rescue, guys. Where, where do I have that? Where do I have that here? Yeah. And it's, if we have a look on this slide... 
the 5 and 2% government loan guarantees. And if the government is micheling in there, if that's going to cause any issues or any mess. So, while would-be home buyer Maynard would welcome the drop in prices, she is cautious about how rising rates could affect her repayments. I think it's really important that you are factoring the calculation into your plan, she told the ABC's PM program. Not going too close to the end of the budget. You want to leave some fat there for those increases because they are significant when you calculate them. Yes. I don't know why we're talking about this person, but okay. I mean, yeah, that, that's the thing. You need to prepare for it. The banks allow for a buffer in deciding if they can give you a loan, but you've got to take into account your quality of life, what life you want to live. There are going to be people that are, uh, that are getting a harsh dose of reality on what their quality of life will be and that's going to affect our retail sector. So recent buyers most at risk from rising rates. Aside from sinking housing prices, rising interest rates will obviously also increase repayments for existing borrowers. Analysis by the Reserve Bank revealed that most borrowers should be able to cope with these higher repayments relatively comfortably. If interest rates were to rise by two percentage points, which is around the middle of current economist forecasts, the RBA analysis found 40% of borrowers are already making average monthly repayments that would cover the increase in minimum repayments. Another 20% would see their repayments rise no more than 20% from what they're currently paying. However, one in five borrowers would see their minimum repayment increase by 40%. These borrowers also tend to have lower accumulated savings and loan repayment buffers than the average mortgage consumer. While the average borrower has a buffer of around 45 months at current interest rates, the median or typical borrower is around 21 months ahead, up from 10 months at the start of the pandemic. So nearly two years ahead. Nearly two years ahead. That gives you time to be flexible. However, of the quarter of borrowers whose repayments would rise by 30% or more, around half have accumulated excess payment buffers equivalent to at least a year's worth of their current repayments. So the households facing the biggest increase in repayments denominated by more recent home buyers are on average have the smallest financial buffers saved up to cope with those at higher repayments. Well, that makes sense because they've just got into it recently. With two percentage points of rate increases, the proportion of borrowers facing a debt servicing ratio greater than 30% would double from 10% to just under 20%. So you'd have 20% of borrowers at the definition of housing stress. And let me bring up this definition here just to make sure we're talking about it. Just just bear with me. Bear with me, everyone. So the definition of housing stress, typically described as lower income households that spend more than 30% of their gross income on housing costs. Lower income. Okay, not everyone, just the lower income households. And this is the ABS definition for it. And there's quite... It's quite a spread in incomes here in Australia, guys. We're not, we're not all equal. So, this is considered a level, level of repayment that puts borrowers in or at higher risk of mortgage stress. So, falling real wages are a risk to the financial system. The Reserve Bank also warned of the potential risk of a double whammy for households facing higher interest rates if wages growth did not also pick up to match. If rising inflation was to erode real household incomes, some borrowers may have to draw down their accumulated excess payment buffers much more quickly and or cut back on other spending, it noted. Well, yeah, they're going to have to cut back on other spending. There are some risks around borrowers' capacity to pay if rising inflation is not accompanied by faster household income growth and rising business profitability. These are issues that many homeowners as well as prospective buyers like Maynard are all too aware of. A few hundred is okay, once you start getting over that, you really need to reassess. You want to hope that you're, you've, you're aligning your income to keeping increasing to support those influxes, she added. Well, you've got to get a diversity of income streams. Maybe, maybe, maybe you just need to get a cushy government job where you get pay rises. I was talking yesterday to a lady I met. Her business had to shut down on the Gold Coast motel. And I was saying... Isn't that fantastic? All the civil servants, they all got their pay rises. They weren't impacted by any of the things they're saying. So, yeah. 
She agreed. It's pretty, uh, pretty nice when you see that, isn't it? Definitely, we all have to think about what the inflation and the increase in expenses is going to look like over, over the next two to three, five years even. Factors like this have led the Reserve Bank to conclude that medium-term systemic risk remains elevated. It is important that lending standards do not slip and that borrowing and lending decisions are resilient to higher interest rates and the potential for falls in house prices and a real, real incomes it cautioned. Now, here's the thing where people are concerned that you've got lie loans, where you've got a whole lot of people, mortgage brokers, that have just put bullshit loans together, everything in, and the people can't service them if we start going crazy. Now, there are going to be some. There will be some. We'll have to see how many there are and if it's enough to actually make an impact on property prices significantly. So, there have been concerns raised about an increase in high debt-to-income lending over the past year, where borrowers are taking on debt more than six times their annual household incomes. Such loans may made up nearly a quarter of all mortgages issued in the last three months of the year. The RBA noted that around 60% of the increase in high Debt-to-income loans has been for loans with ratios between 6 and 7, although that means about 40% of the increase in these high-risk loans have been for loans where households are borrowing more than 7 times their annual income. Aside from the risk of borrowers being unable to keep up their loan repayments and defaulting, the Reserve Bank is conscious that heavily indebted households may make the economy much more sensitive to interest rate rises than in the past. High debt-to-income loans can also increase macroeconomic risks as these borrowers are more likely to need to reduce their consumption when faced with a cash flow shock, the report noted. However, the bank did add that many of the households with high debt relative to their incomes, especially investors, also had significant savings and wealth. Liaison with banks indicated that some high debt-to-income loans are originated with relatively large offset account balances the FSR noted. It also observed that only 1.5% of loans issued in 2021, December quarter, had both a loan-to-value ratio above 90% and a DTI above 6, but added that these borrowers are estimated to be four times more likely to report mortgage stress. Nonetheless, banking regulator APRA has recently completed consultation with lenders on its plan to require them to operationally be ready to implement limits on high DTI, high LVR investor or interest-only lending, or a combination of any of the two. This will give the regulator the ability to quickly restrict these type of lending if it feels they are becoming too prevalent and creating risk for the broader financial system. While the focus of the FSR is on the stability of the financial system and therefore focuses heavily on mortgages and other borrowers, the RBA also noted There are currently far more renters vulnerable to financial stress than people with home loans. Yes, that's that's a huge issue. That's a really big issue. Clive Palmer with his 3% mortgage keeper. The renters are going to cop it because the investors are going to up the rent. That's that's what's going to happen. 15% of renters were vulnerable to financial stress. Define it as less than a month of disposable income and easily accessible savings and spending more than 30% of disposable income on rent. It warned this could be a financial risk if it meant more vacant properties and rent arrears or falling rents for landlords. So let's, let's have a bit of a talk about this one. I think that's the, the real takeaway from all of this. If housing crashes by 15%, does it matter that much in the grand scheme of things. There'll be some people that pick up a bargain. There'll be a few people in negative equity. Uh, some people may, you know, the interest rate rises may sting a few people, but a lot of people have buffers. Investors have options. It's going to be the retail sector that cops it, and it's going to be the people in rental accommodation that cops it. So it's, it's going to be the, the poorest people in Australia that are going to cop it. It's not going to be the house owners. And the government has shown they'll do whatever they can to protect or the government uses the housing sector to stimulate the economy. Both sides do. And, well, it's effective. It is effective and it works. We're a house-proud nation. You get much more bang for your buck by incentivizing people to renovate their homes than you do for, through other government methods of 
spending their money. Now, this isn't necessary. I'm not saying it's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm just saying, saying, it's saying the reality of it. What we need to do to address particularly the renting issue is to make it easier to build. We need to increase supply significantly. We need, we need to make it much easier for the average Joe blog to do a small development, to even just split a block. You've got to, if you haven't been through the process, you don't know all the bullshit you need to go through, all the hoops you need to jump through. Every person with a vested interest put, gets that pushed onto the building code, gets that pushed onto all the legislation, and it all adds cost. Even you know energy requirements adds cost. You've got to do a $1,500 report for an extension on a house. You didn't have to do that in the 80s. Oh, but it'll save the environment. It won't make jack shit of difference. I've seen the modeling. I've seen how it's all bullshit. That, that really, seeing that in my architectural education, how cause construction, we're one of the biggest, biggest sources of um, carbon and embodied energy on the planet. And seeing how they twig the numbers and how they can change the modeling really made me become quite skeptical out of all of it. But this is the thing. We need more supply. We need more housing. We need to address the not-in-my-backyard crowd. We need to address the politicians that will limit development. We need to address the councils that are restricting supply. We have councils that are bitching and moaning that they've got accommodation shortages and people with nowhere to live and you've got homeless, but they're not making it easy for people to develop. They're restricting development. You can't have it both ways, guys. So there we go. What do you reckon? Are you worried about a 15% housing crash? Let me know in the comments below. Would you even notice it, guys? If your property went 15% down, 20% down, 50% down, for a house you're living in, do you care? If you're an investor, would you just write it out? Anyway, thank you all for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe to the channel. If you're a fan and enjoy the content I find and put together here, there are a few ways you can help out. You can join us on YouTube or Patreon. You can sign up for self-wealth or... No, hang on. I can't say that. Uh, <laughs> I need to get a license. I need to get an ASIC license so I can say that. I should, I should go through the process of getting one just for that. So suggesting people use a legitimate business, I'll get in trouble for. But if I tell you to use a Ponzi scheme, crypto scam, it's all good. There you go, guys. We're paying for this shit from the government. Anyway, have a great day. I'm going to be trying to dig up columns, concrete columns today. So wish me luck and I'll see you in the next episode of Heiser Says. I might release this one at, at nighttime. So I might have already spent all day digging columns and be watching it exhausted. Ask me in the, tell me in the comments if you, if I survived. <laughs> Anyone want four tons of concrete dust? <laughs>